Our scripture today is from the book of Daniel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 19. Then Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar, was severely distressed for a while. His thoughts terrified him. The king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or the interpretation terrify you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, may the, dr may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew great and strong, so that its top reached to heaven and was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and which, food pro and which provided food for all, under which animals of the field lived and in whose branches the birds of the air had nests. It is you, O king. You have grown great and strong. Your greatness has increased and reaches to heaven and your sovereignty to the ends of the earth. And whereas the king saw a holy watcher coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the ground with a band of iron and bronze in the grass of the field, and let him be bathed with the dew of heaven, and let his lot be with the animals of the field until seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And it is a decree of the Most High that has come upon my Lord the King. You shall be driven away from human society, and your dwelling shall be with the wild animals. You shall be made to eat grass like oxen. You shall be bathed with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you until you have learned that the Most High has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals and gives it to whom he will." As it was commanded to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be reestablished for you from the time that you learn that heaven is sovereign. Therefore, O king, may my counsel be acceptable to you. Atone for your sins with righteousness and your iniquities with mercy to the oppressed, so that your prosperity may be prolonged. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Blair. Morning, everyone. Today, if you were to travel to Stockholm, Sweden, in the harbor of the city, there is a gigantic building uh, about the size of an airplane hangar that covers what used to be a, a, an old ancient dock in the city in the harbor. And out of the water, a number of years ago, they sought to bring up out of the water this massive sailing vessel uh, called the Vasa. And it was a ship that was commissioned by King Gustavus Adolphus. And uh, the story behind this ship was, is that the king was so proud of this ship that he had it built with all kinds of gore, uh, gold ornamentation, uh, the best cannons loaded up with cannons and cannonballs and uh, in, in elaborate carvings. If you go to look at this today, it is a gorgeous ship. The problem was, is that as soon as it was finished being built, they set it out to the harbor and out to sea, and it immediately tipped over and sank from its own weight. It was too ordained with gold and cannonballs and cannons and other uh, wonderful intricacies that made the ship spectacularly beautiful. But out of a sense of great pride, the ship was created and it was too much for it even to hold itself upright. It tipped over, sunk where it was built, and stayed underwater for many, many years until in the last century it was brought up, restored, and made a museum. Pride is a dangerous thing. Pride is a very dangerous thing. We heard a little bit about it from Lisa in the children's message. I think uh, the king of Sweden understood something about pride and learned a lesson at that point in his life. We heard a story of pride just a moment ago, which we'll get into a little bit more later. And for those of you who were here this week on Tuesday night and watched uh, the movie Brave, you saw a little bit about how Merida had to deal with her own pride. So for those of you who have never seen the movie Brave, uh, it was part of our uh, sermon series now called Pixar in the Pulpit. We're looking at Disney Pixar Animation Studios films, watching a different movie on Tuesday night, then seeking to uh, tie it in in some way to worship in the scriptures on Sunday morning. And uh, this one is an interesting tale. It's a story of a little girl named Merida who grows up in the Scottish Highlands as a princess. Except Merida really wishes she wasn't a princess because she doesn't like all of the baggage that comes along with being a princess. 
being prim and proper, having to do exactly what your parents tell you, including uh, arranged marriages and things, things of this nature. So Merida is this prideful little girl, and the story begins where she has now come of age and is able to get married, and her parents, the king and queen, call in the three neighboring kingdoms, and they ask them to bring their young male suitors uh, who might be able to propose to Merida and show their strengths uh, and their feats of courage through some Highland games. And so they come and they arrive and Merida is disgusted by the whole affair. She wishes she would have no part of it. And as you heard, she even disguises herself and bests the three of these suitors in an archery contest. Well, this sends her mom over the moon with anger. And she follows Merida up to her bedroom where Merida has a temper tantrum and says, I will not do this. I don't want you to tell me who to get married. I'm not ready to get married. I don't want to. I don't like being a princess. I would rather spend my time in the woods and riding my horse and practicing archery. But all of these things that a princess is supposed to do are the things that you want from me, not what I want from me. And they have this intense argument and Merida looks over to the wall where her mother has just finished hanging this beautiful tapestry, which is a family portrait. Merida takes her sword and slices it, cutting apart herself and her mother in the tapestry. Well, this sends her mother into rage. She takes her bow, throws it on the fire pit, and Merida storms out and runs away off into the woods by herself. A short time later, wandering in the woods, she comes across a little cottage, and the cottage happens to belong to a witch. She goes in, talks to the witch, and says, I want to pay you to cast a spell on my mother. I don't want to do what she tells me to do. I do not want to marry these men that she wants me uh, to be engaged to one of them. So the witch gives her a spell, and Merida gets her way. She definitely gets her way. The problem was that the spell turns her mother into a bear. Now. Merida begins to regret this quickly, seeing her mother turn into a bear. It wasn't just that her mind was changed, it's now that her whole person was, is changed. And so Merida spends her time with her mother, the bear, over the next several days trying to get things back to normal. They go back to the witch's cottage and a message is left there and the witch says, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. If you want to undo the spell, you're going to have to mend the bond that was torn by pride. Merida can't figure out what this means. Her mother is only speaking in bear at this point, so she's not of much help. And they have two days to figure this out before she stays a bear forever. Well, that's where the story leads us. Now, I know you're wondering what in the world it has to do with Daniel. And I will tell you this. I think actually more than you might expect. So the story of Daniel is an interesting book in the Bible. It's really divided into two portions. The first part talks about Daniel and three other young men who were uh, uh, in involved in the king's court at the time of the Babylonian exile. The other half of Daniel talks about these apocalyptic visions that Daniel receives. And so the book is very different from the front few chapters to the back several chapters. But we're going to be dealing with the fourth chapter today, which is this part about the story of Daniel and the three other men who were uh, in the king's court. And the three other men, of course, are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, we're not going to talk about them because their part of the story really happens before the fourth chapter. But King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And he is a very powerful king. And, as it turns out, very prideful. Well, he's been having these bizarre dreams which terrify him. He wakes up in a cold sweat and he's, he's anxious about what these dreams are and what they mean. He believes that there is a message within these dreams that needs to be interpreted. And at this point, it sounds a lot like the story of Joseph and Pharaoh from Genesis. One of the key differences, however, is that Joseph got to hear the dream from the Pharaoh and then got to make the interpretation. Daniel doesn't even get to hear what the dream's about. The king just says, somebody interpret my dream. I had it last night. Oh, and if you can't do it, you'll be torn limb from limb. So not a lot of volunteers for the dream interpretation at this point. But God tells Daniel what the dream was about. Daniel comes forward and says, the living God, the God of Israel, has told me what your dream means. And he says, okay, let's have it. Tell me about my dream. 
He says, well, in your dream you saw a giant tree, and the branches were really broad and stretched as far as the earth and all the way up to heaven. And this dream, the tree is gorgeous, it's powerful, it's rich, it's strong, it has a deep root system which goes into the earth. And that tree is going to get cut down. And the stump will remain, and so will the roots, but the tree will be done away with. And then there will be this time period where there will be a living among the animals. And you will behave as an animal, and you will live for that time until you have learned your lesson, until your pride subsides. And then Daniel says, and by the way, that tree is you. You are the tree. Your kingdom has spread far and wide. You are very mighty and powerful and strong as a king, but your pride is too great. You will be cut down by God, and then you will have to go live among the animals. Your bathing will be done in the dew of the morning grass. Your food will be the grasses that grow. You will live among the animals in the wild, and you will be in exile for seven years until you have learned your lesson at which point you may be able to return. So maybe now you're saying how this story and the story in Brave actually are a little bit similar. This great hubris and act of pride has caused a rift. Somebody is being cut down to size. And yet there's a stump and a root system that remains, that the door isn't permanently closed forever, that the mistakes that were committed are not forever and not unable to be overcome. Merida finds out and realizes that it's the tapestry that must be mended, mend the bond that was torn by pride. If she sews the tapestry up again and reconciles with her mother, her mother will be spared from being a bear forever. But in the meantime, she has to live in the wilderness with the wild animals and live and eat as they do. They eat fish from the stream, she has to live with her mother the bear, And in time, things work out. Surprise, surprise, right? It's a happy end. Nebuchadnezzar, on the other hand, is, we find out a few verses later, he's strolling around, particularly proud of himself as he is surveying his kingdom from on high. And all of a sudden, God says, this is the moment. He's taken away. The kingdom folds. The tree is cut down, if you will. And he is removed and taken into exile where he will live among the wild animals for seven years. At which point we find in the story, he has a change of heart. He turns his attention to God and says, this is where I want to declare all the power of the universe. This living God is the greatest thing, not me. And at that point, he is restored to his throne again. Now. I think it's something that we all struggle with is pride from time to time. We like to think that even if it's not the kind of pride where we think we're the greatest thing ever, we're the best at what we've ever done, we're among the brightest of the people that we know, that isn't the stuff that I feel like most people suffer with. I mean, there are people, certainly, that think that way. But for most of us, our pride comes in the form of actually a little bit more like Nebuchadnezzar's. I can do it on my own. I've got this. I can take control. I'll ask God for help if necessary, but really it's me who's behind the wheel on this. But that in and of itself is an act of pride. We're reminded through the scriptures, we're reminded through the teachings of Christ that it is us needing to put God at the forefront of our lives. Not giving God room, making God the center of our lives, which is where we need to be living. That is how we need to live our lives, which isn't the same as saying, God, I'm just going to take a back seat. You got this. No, it's our involvement, but it's always remembering where we are in the pecking order. God first, then comes us. God first, then comes us. But the other thing I really like about this particular story in Daniel is that even though we're looking at a king who's been responsible for the exile, he's the the king of Babylonia. I mean, not a good guy. And yet, even in this story, he's given a second chance. A God of mercy 
and grace ultimately says, I want you to be humbled to learn your lesson, but I'm going to leave the door open for you. You'll have another opportunity at this. So whether or not this story resonates for you today, whether or not hubris and pride are something that you find to be a struggle of yours, there is a point that all of us need to ask for forgiveness and mercy again today. And as we prepare to come to the communion table and receive of this sacrament, we will do the same thing that we do every month, which is before we partake in the meal, we ask for forgiveness. So that we may come down the aisle this morning with our hands ready not to take, but to receive this gift that Christ has given us. And we are able to do so with a clean heart because we are forgiven, we have been freed, we have been liberated through the saving works of Jesus Christ and the merciful God who created us all. Will you prepare for this time of communion together?